Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to Finding Me in the ITV Networks. I have with me today Adebayo Okeru, who is a human rights lawyer who's committed the last decade or so to very many issues of social justice, environmental justice and international criminal uh, procedure. Adebayo is also the African program manager for the organization entitled Witness.org, which documents human rights violations. And as a result, his passion has been merging the divide between technology and human rights. Although a novice, he would say of himself, I do believe he is very talented and has won two photography awards for human rights as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for being here, Adebayo. Thank you, Curator. It's great to be here. I know it's fascinating that you have combined this whole notion of photography with human rights and, uh, you know, going on to basically images, documenting human rights, etc. Tell me, like, you know, from your studies to, to moving to this divide, like, how did you uh, traverse this path? It's a good question that I get asked a lot of times. Are you a lawyer or a photographer? <laughs> and I'm just saying I'm both, actually. So I'm, I'm that kind of lawyer who believes that visuals do have an amazing power to create change and in, the, in this sense I mean pictures and videos I would say the way it kind of happened for me is back in the organizations I've worked before back in Nigeria because I'm from Nigeria we always had to deal with issues of um, community rights land rights issues of forced evictions and most times when you get into these communities and there's been a forced eviction and a demolition for instance you are left asking the question, what existed before? Did anybody capture that whole process of this demolition happening? And in most instances, you find that the people did not, you know, they had not caught anything on camera. And it made it easier for people to deny the extent of the brutality that was meted out while that eviction was being carried out. And so my organization back then called CERAC started to, you know, take the camera with us. And whenever we got the notification that a forced eviction was about to happen, we ran into the community and we armed with our camera. And I was the guy who was always carrying the camera. We would take pictures of this happening so as to use it subsequently in the court of law or just as an advocacy tool to show people that this is what is happening because that way you can then genera um, generate empathy and sympathy from the general public and subsequently also be able to show the court that this is an injustice that has occurred. And um, on and on down the line, every other organization I've worked with, I have always combined that with my legal proceedings in courts, and it has always proven to be effective. Um, but I think the turning point came in 2014 during the Bring Back Our Girls campaign when um, I was now in South Africa and I was so far away from Nigeria and I felt so compelled to do something about what was happening back in Nigeria with Bring Back Our Girls. So myself and a couple of other friends, I gathered them together from other parts of Africa and said, let us create a campaign, a video that would speak to the injustice of this um, kidnapping and demand that the government of Nigeria should do something about it. And so this was us creating a video for advocacy purposes. However, it was a video that I shot on my phone, but put up on YouTube and ended up raking up a number of views unexpectedly and then also subsequently led to me being asked to come on SABC to speak about this. And at that point I felt, if I could use my phone to really bring attention to something this critical and also allow me to further create a, a lot of um, attention around this, I mean, alongside everybody else that was also speaking about the issue at the time, I felt I could do this a, a lot more deliberately. And from 2014 there on, I had been more deliberate about how I used it um, for creating campaign videos and photographic campaigns as well. And fortunately, some of them have yielded great and amazing results. Tell us a little bit about your uh, presentation on TEDx Pretoria, because that's yes. a fascinating topic. That's yes. about injustice. Or yes. Like so my, my, I had the opportunity in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, to speak at the um, TEDx Pretoria platform. And my talk was specifically titled The Visual Disruption of Injustice. And it was also because, I mean, since that 2014 turning point, a number of attention I mean, was being given to the work I was now doing, using visuals to create change and to spark debates and to pursue accountability. And it then led to me being given the opportunity to speak about the power of visuals on the TEDx Pretoria platform in 2017. And um, I would really encourage your viewers to actually try and check out, check out that video. It's on YouTube, on the TEDx uh, YouTube page. And, but essentially, it was talking about how each one of us can be an activist just with the tool that you have in your hand, which is your, your cell phone most times. So 
if you're a witness to any form of injustice, taking out your phone to document that can go a long way in preserving that evidence and being able to seek justice for the victims over the perpetrators, um, whether in a court of law or in a tribunal or in international criminal courts, as a matter of fact as well. And even if it doesn't happen immediately, it could be preserved for a future use. And um, that way, the memory of that injustice is never erased. So that's something that, I mean, we could elaborate on that and go on and on about how that could be done also to be done in a safe manner and in an effective manner because some of the challenges we also see is when people take out their phones to record they do not um, pay attention attention to some of the key details that would help in a court of law that would be you know valuable as a minimal threshold for evidentiary purposes so yeah so is that something that you think that people especially young people who love to walk around with their smartphones etc and love to record information because many people say we want to do something but what do we do or we don't know how or others say we're afraid so if you're afraid and you can't physically go and stop an injustice but at least record it so that you have something to like you say to document and to then substantiate that something happened here and I was a witness to it. Yes, um, I definitely think there's a lot people can do and it could start definitely from just uh, getting involved by documenting that evidence. Um, at Witness, we definitely always encourage that you should do that only if it is safe to do so because there is almost no point you putting yourself in harm's way just because you want to capture that moment. Um, it's better that you are also safe in the process. And um, if you can then ensure that you can be safe in the process, even if it's recording from a distance, then go ahead and take out your phone or your camera, or whatever you have in your hands, and document that, that injustice. And documenting the injustice does not just mean, oh, just putting out your camera and recording the whole scene. Pay attention to some of the violations, like who is the commander, for instance, because when you're trying to hold someone accountable, you want to be able to trace the command chain as well. So is somebody else at the corner, like if it's in a case of a police brutality or military injustice, is somebody given the orders from the corner to ask someone to brutalize a civilian, for instance, because then you want to be able to say, who are we placing the responsibility on? How do we trace that to, to the person responsible? Do you want to cover sig insignias like, you know, maybe some badges or some names or some street signs to be able to show the location at where it happened? Because when you do record these videos, before we used to say seeing is believing, but we're in that era now when people would even see a video and would still want to discredit it. Yeah, fake wanna... news, so much fake news. Yeah, yeah, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, all that whole issue is also bubbling up at this point. And you want to be able to ensure as much as possible to avert that and create a lot of detail in your video that would enhance the credibility of that video for anybody who wants to use it to pursue justice. So just documenting things such as street signs or the location where you're recording at, or just speaking on the camera if you can and saying, I'm here today is the so-and-so date in this so-and-so month, in this so-and-so year, I'm at this location. Sometimes it's impossible to do that. It's definitely sometimes chaotic and the trauma is real. And it happens very quickly too. And it happens so soon and so fast. And But when you when you have you know been trained and thought about these things before that situation arises, then when it arises, you're ready to you yeah, know, you're spontaneously. You're far more prepared. Yeah, you're better prepared to be able to just take out your phone and do the right thing at that. Tell us about your awards, <laughs> your photography awards. I want to brag now, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I was um, privileged, I've been privileged to win two photography awards. One, incidentally, was here, well, it was given to me in South Africa and the other was given to me in Italy, in Europe. Um, both of them were human rights related and they covered um, issues of human rights. One was on general human rights and what happened was I had traveled to Swaziland on a field trip and um, a number of other human rights um, activists and students had been asked to document what they saw in the different fields that they went to and they should submit that entry. And my entry came out as, the, as, as one of the best or as the best overall. There were three that were rewarded. Mine was the was the top best, and my other colleagues, one from Kenya and another person from, uh, I think, South Africa, if I'm not mistaken, also got awards. But mine was about a girl who was on a farm who I saw herding cattle in Swaziland when she was meant to be in school. And so I, I found that very curious. First of all, you don't typically see a girl herding cattle. It's usually the boys. But whether it's a boy or a girl, it wasn't acceptable anyway. And the interesting thing is this girl was herding it with so much joy and you know there was this smile on her face and 
I, I took that, that moment, I captured that moment with her brimming with a smile in front of this cattle. And I, I, the message was that this girl ought to be in school. You know, she shouldn't be herding cattle, regardless of the joy on her face. She deserves the right to education. And I think the, the framing of that picture in, in the context of the right to education was what appealed and made it a, a winning photograph. And the second one was um, in Italy, which um, spoke to the right of migrants. Um, in South Africa especially, I had a photo that depicted um, migrants who were in South Africa and there were two of them. And the story was that South Africa is a rainbow nation. And in that respect, you should see it as an opportunity to be welcoming to the whole of Africa and not as a burden when you have migrants coming in. It's a, it's a beautiful thing when you have a rainbow, a country that calls itself a rainbow nation. And part of that rainbow is to have the diversity of Africans being able to call this place home. So that also resonated and it won the, it won the best prize. It was exhibited in, in Venice and um, a number of people went into Venice and they said, I saw your photo, it was you know, blown up. And I got the opportunity to also go to Venice based on that, that award. So I, I'm glad that not ju just were my photographs capturing issues of human rights and speaking to those injustices, but then people see it and also are able to further communicate that message to a bigger audience. That's fascinating because I mean, the whole issue of migrants and South Africa and then refugees in South Africa has been a hot seat for the last few months as well in this country. And it seems that we, we remember for a little while and then we forget. And South Africans somehow have a very short memory about their recent past and the fact that the rest of Africa has always been there to support them. And that we actually have to remind South Africans that, you know what, you should welcome these people just as they welcomed you. Now, as a foreigner in our country as well, I'm sure it must be a significant issue at the top of your mind as well. And recently, with the attacks on Africans, what we call Afrophobia, not xenophobia, because the attacks were basically on black Africans, you know, not on any, or, or foreigners, not on, on anybody else, not on the white foreigners, and we have plenty of them in South Africa. So the whole question begs to, you know, what is this? What is this whole problem that underlies the South African strata? And have you had a similar experience in Nigeria? And how did you deal with it? <laughs> That's a very important question and one that could uh, require a lot of time to unpack, but I'll make it quick. So um, as a foreigner in South Africa, I've, I've really not experienced um, Afrophobia. And I can only say I've not experienced that not because it doesn't exist, but because I am pretty much insulated. I am doing my PhD at the University of Pretoria. So it's a community where you already have a diverse group of people from all around Africa. And I think there's a greater understanding of why it is important for all of us to come together as Africans or from all around the world. Um, however, I acknowledge that Afrophobia is a huge problem in South Africa. And I think ad ad enlightenment or acknowledgement, first of all, that issue would be the first step towards solving it. Secondly, then there needs to be a lot of enlightenment around how that foreigners are not the ones coming to take your jobs or cause crime. If there's an issue of crime, let the government deal with it based on a criminal issue, not based on a nationality issue, because it's not Nigerians only that are causing crimes. Yeah, there are Nigerians that are causing crimes, or there are South Africans that are causing crimes. So it's not because of your nationality that you're a criminal. Uh, being a criminal is a, is a decision that individuals make, and it doesn't mean whether you're from whatever country you're from, crime exists just because people are bad, just generally speaking. So deal with that on that premise, not because of nationality. And if we're just to look back in, into history, Nigeria also had its own phase when it asked foreigners to leave the country back in the 1980s. And um, it was that time where, if you're familiar with that time, it was something we called Ghana must go because Nigeria asked Ghana, it was during the oil boom and Nigeria asked Ghana and other countries to leave the country because it, it was the time when also civilians in the country and citizens were saying, oh, we are now having this same story of um, citizens from other countries coming to take our jobs, crime are being committed, and we needed to have them leave the country. And they succeeded in pushing a lot of African foreigners out of Nigeria at the time. But fast forward to 2019, some of the problems still exist. There's still high unemployment in Nigeria. There's still crime in Nigeria. But the foreigners were pushed out. So what happened? And that's what I always remember. So and then people. actually, what's causing this problem? That was never us. Exactly. It? it was never the migrants. It was never the foreigners. It was just a lack of government responsible governance. So when you have these issues of unemployment in the country, I think the right thing for civilians or citizens of that country to do is to hold their government accountable. 
and not to turn on the other as being the ones guilty of it. We have to go to a break. When we come back, we'll take just a little further. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the second segment of a very interesting interview today. And I mean, this is a, a wonderful conversation. I thoroughly enjoy discussing these issues as I think it raises a lot of questions, especially for us ordinary South Africans who sit and just fall with, you know, the, the sound bites, the stereotypical narratives, the, the slantings that are put forward. And always it, it, in these issues, it's always a matter of, you know, let the foreigners go. So with me is Adebayo, who is the program manager for Africa of the organization called Witness. And we're speaking about human rights issues. Now, before we went on to the break, you spoke about Nigeria's episode of Ghana must go, you know, as we had Zuma must go in South Africa. But I mean, the, these are tragic moments in our history. It's almost, it's almost embarrassing to say that, you know what, this was actually a part of our country. This is the way our country behaved. Yet Nigeria was so welcoming to South African, um, you know, South African uh, freedom fighters, for example, the ANC, etc. When they were busy fighting the apartheid government, Nigeria did a lot for them. So how do we have these turnarounds? You know, how do we have these two sides to the same face of a particular coin? I think it's, it starts from the lack of um, enlightenment. Many people do not know the history and um, it needs to be said that Nigeria did play a role, just like many other African countries. Some were um, bringing in ANC freedom fighters and allowing them to have exile in other African countries. Some African countries actually issued passports to allow these ANC freedom fighters, people to travel around um, the world because they were not necessarily welcome and were at risk in South Africa at the time fighting against the apartheid government. But Nigeria specifically, I remember um, every civil servant in Nigeria was mandated to pay something called the Mandela tax. So an amount was deducted from their monthly salary that was then put into this Mandela tax and sent to South Africa to support the freedom fighters and the, 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 the push against the apartheid government. That was something that really did happen and which people gladly contributed to, to ensure that South Africa was you know, relieved and released from the shackles of apartheid. So there was a lot of contribution that was given back then to the struggle here in South Africa. And it's not just because of that that people need to just now pay attention and say, oh, welcome other African countries. Yes, that's part of the reasoning that you should look at, but just for the basic fact that it's the humane thing to do. But don't you also think that it's about a recognition of the potential that Africa has? So on the one hand, I see this kind of discrepancy that you welcome white foreigners thinking they're going to bring more technology, more progress, more advancement, and then you shun the African uh, neighbors or the rest of Africa thinking they're just going to bring trouble. So your perspective of Africa is only violence or fear or criminality but nothing potentially good and that's how we've been brainwashed but we continue to exhibit those behaviors towards our African brothers. It cuts across every area of the Af African continent not just in terms of when you think of South Africa and the Afrophobia but also when you think about the African Union you look at Africa before the colonial era it was colonialism that demarcated Africa as it currently exists we didn't have this borders that we currently have but they dis divided us and all of that that is real from history but then you look at Africa currently today, I can't, as a Nigerian, have uh, an, the ability to go into many African countries without a visa. Whereas people from the West, from North America, from Europe can come in and they don't require a visa. We lack the trust in each other and yet we are on the same continent. I can have just with one visa, the Schengen visa going to Europe and I can from France going to Germany, from Germany going to another like Belgium and in my own continent. I have to get a visa to come to South Africa. I have to get a visa to go to Zimbabwe. I have to get a visa to go to Kenya. On and on like that. We are not ready as Africans to, to embrace each other. I don't think we are. And it's not just a South African problem. It's an African problem. And I also acknowledge that it's also a Nigerian problem because Nigeria also requires visas for some other African nationals. But then when you come to sub-regional sub -regional level, we have ECOWAS, we have SADC, we have the EAC. And sub-regionally, we are you know, able to move more freely. You don't so it's a, a bit visa. more integration. Yes, right? it's more integration. I can go from Nigeria to Ghana without requiring a visa. 
But that is something we should see happen across the continent. We should trust each other more. And until we get to that point, I don't think we're ready for real integration. And nobody should just point fingers at South Africa. Yes, South Africa should own this issue of Afrophobic violence, but other African countries should also look in the, in the mirror and see how they treat their fellow Africans as being unfair and unreasonable. Whereas you welcome other people from other parts of the world with open arms and you don't trust your own. Yeah, I've always found it rather irritating that if you want to travel within Africa, the cost of the airfare is so much higher than if you have to leave Africa and go to, to Europe, another continent. Yeah. It's still a real thing. I mean, sometimes it's not just even in the airfare, it's also in the time it takes you. If you want to go to the Gambia, for instance, you may not have a direct flight to the Gambia. You have to go through maybe Accra or through Dakar or through Lagos before you get to the Gambia. Whereas somebody from Europe might actually be able to get a direct flight. I recently was in Dakar and I had to take three, two stops before I got to Dakar. Whereas a colleague that was traveling from Amsterdam only had one stop, had a shorter time travel and was able to get to, the, um, to Dakar before I did. And I was there. She still left before I did because I couldn't get a flight. So I had to stay one more night because I was coming back to South Africa. It is insane. So from travel to trade to human movement, migration, Africa needs to wake up. We need to embrace each other and break down the barriers that currently exist in between our countries. We break down the barriers that currently exist by recognizing each other firstly and then learning about each other rather than being taught how to perceive the other because I mean I recently taught um, a class to my political science students and said that in South Africa particularly we have been taught to hate and fear our African neighbors and hate has been taught it's, it's been a it's been a systematic form of colonization in an apartheid in South Africa and I'm sure there's certain aspects of it as you say in the rest of Africa especially in countries that have been colonized but besides recognizing each other and learning about each other, we also need to stand up for each other. That requires solidarity and that requires, as you said, activism. Now, tell us a little bit about Witness, the organization that you have joined and its African program. So um, Witness is an organization um, headquartered in New York and I'm privileged to be the Africa program manager. And so I head the programs that we do within the African continent and that traverses a, a wide range of issues from land rights to war crimes to police brutality and many others and what we're trying to do is to empower many people to to see the value in using visuals as a means to create change and technology as well so when you think about how an atrocity is being committed maybe to an indigenous community for instance a big corporation is coming into that community and wants to establish a coal mine and they do not seek the permission of that community and they went on to establish this coal mine that has now gone on to impact the livelihood livelihood of this community polluted their water and other damages that have been caused how can that community stand up by themselves to document those atrocities and how can they push for justice either locally or internationally so we, we get involved in those kinds of things we support people to get those documentation done effectively and then be able to support them also to amplify their voices to a greater audience where they can then get justice and we've succeeded in many cases the Endorise case for those who might be familiar with it in, in, in Kenya and other issues with the war crimes, for instance, we were very instrumental to the Thomas Lubanga case that happened before the International Criminal Court um, around issues of child soldiers being used um, in, in the war in the, in the DRC. And on and on like that, we're trying to just support people to do that. But also at the center of it is to be able to push for justice and accountability and to be able to rally and mobilize people together and say that, you know what, we can stand together and fight against anything that wants to seek to divide us. But in all of this, there needs to be an ethical stance, a recognition that in whatever you do, you need to be ethical and you need to be absolutely honest when documenting. So that it might be that to a certain extent, even the oppressed can become oppressor. But so you don't sideline those kind of issues, but you present the entire picture, isn't 100%. it? A hundred percent. We're right at the end. What parting message would you like? So just to quickly say that we, we also believe in doing no harm. That's the that's a key principle in getting involved when we when we are doing our work at Witness. But as a parting message, I'll just say, you know what? Um, do not feel overwhelmed by some of the injustices that you see around the world. We are making progress bit by bit. Let's acknowledge those things and let us not be overwhelmed, but let us get involved and seek to be the change that we also are striving for. And um, I, I want to believe the world will be a better place if each one of us stand up. I agree with you 100%. Each one of us needs to take responsibility, both for ourselves and for the fact that if something is happening out there, we add 
a voice to help those who are basically voiceless. Thank you very much, Adubayo, for you, sharing Croatia. this wonderful insight. Fiyamani Allah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.